I mean, rem remember, um, the readers should remember um, that um, spy agencies are not their, not their officers, you know, so the CIA is not Langley and, um, you know, MI6 is not Thames House and um, RAW is not Lodi Road and ISI is not APARA. Um, they're just where work gets done. Um, and so uh, because those are um, secret places um, which are classified, um, it's totally wrong, um, apart from in brief, you know, general brief, briefing, meeting, greet rooms, to bring anybody into those premises. So, of course, no one would. Um, and as you know, these being cautious people, um, analysts and spies being the most cautious of all, and having to adhere to very strict secrecy, draconian secrecy laws um, in India especially, um, meetings don't happen in that way. You know, they, they, they happen um, um, in many different countries. They happened um, all across India in about five or six cities stretching from um, Kolkata down to Bangalore. Um, they um, happen um, in Thailand. They happen in the Gulf states, in America, um, Washington, DC, and New York. Um, and they happen in London. Um, and, um, you know, that's the way that people um, like to meet. They use secure messaging. Um, we use the wire, um, signal, telegram. No one uses WhatsApp. And the obvious reasons for that are that they are uh, as aware as everyone else of the vulnerability of WhatsApp. <laughs> Friendship things are said, um, you know, over WhatsApp, but nothing else. Um, things are said face to face in meetings. Now, I, I, I've got a habit, um, anyhow, of um, I tape all my meetings. Um, I have done um, forever, you know, every single meeting that I have, every phone call. Um, but I don't use the tapes for any other thing other than a research tool. And um, in you know, our research place, we, we have transcriptions of every tape going back to 19, you know, 1993. So, um... well, you know, the friendships are an outcome of the whole journalistic career, but um, the book intensively has only been labored on for the last three or four years. We had an idea a long time ago, um, which I, I was telling you about before to make a film. And we were going to make a film based on the Israel, great Israeli film, Gatekeepers. And that film was a documentary feature that got inside the Israeli domestic intelligence service who have never spoken publicly before. And it got successive leaders to appear and retell the story um, of, of covert plays in Israel, Palestine. And we thought, you know, for us, India, Pakistan is much more kinetic, is extremely vital. And um, the rivalry is so bitter between um, RAW um, and um, ISI that it'd be really good to uh, try and get those people to engage, um, those officers and analysts to engage. So we sent them copies of uh, the film. We asked them to watch other movies. We talked about influence and narrative. We talked about Black Hawk Down, how America um, even gets to commemorate failure and makes Hollywood dreams out of failure. And um, the fact that, um, you know, that India and Pakistan don't really do that um, very successfully, although India is good at controlling the narrative. And so um, we decided eventually, um, after lots of um, pain, pain, painstaking, but ultimately fruitless discussions, that we should not do it as a film to start with, that we should do it as a small book. And that in the first book, we'd look at um, ISI, um, RAW, and then later we'd look at CIA um, for a subsequent uh, book. But we'll talk about that later. Um, and um, and so that you know that's how it came about. And then we had to go and sell this idea very strongly. And I think what um, the spy agencies see in Pakistan um, and in India is they see um, influence. So um, as you know, um, the um, theatre at the moment revolves around um, influence, and it revolves around managing opinion, and um, also um, filtering truth um, on social media. Um, in uh, news and print media, online streaming, um, in the theatre halls, and managing truth and perception uh, in both countries um, is absolutely where um, intelligence agencies are. And so, therefore, to influence um, uh, this um, this project also becomes important to influence Kathy and myself to get us to change our views on some elements of Kashmir or change our views on Punjab or or jihad or Pakistan, Raw would want us to see um, a certain set of um, uh, factors. ISI would want us to see another set of factors. And so we have to balance that influence game all the way along. And like we were saying before, the interesting thing was that both sides picked the same chronology. Yeah. So we said, choose the events that are the crucibles, the events which forged 
relationships and the mindsets of intelligence services. And so everyone looked at um, 94 kidnapping in Delhi, um, by Omar Sheikh, the 95 kidnapping in Kashmir, which is an attempt to free Masood Azhar and Omar Sheikh. The 1999 hijacking of um, IC814, which landed in, was forced down in Kandahar, which is an attempt to free Masood Azza, Omar Sheikh, perpetrated by Masood Azza's family um, and organized by Elias Kashmiri and Amjad, Amjad Faruqi. Um, and then post 9 11, the same people would then become part of the assassination death squad that tried repeatedly to kill Musharraf, to decimate the RSI. And they were like a snowball gathering around them more and more functionaries and assassins murderers, former spies, former soldiers, huge elements of the Pakistan state. And so, you know, the chronology came together, 2611, Path and Cop, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, Path and Cop, Paul Wama, Balakot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, both sides chose the same events because what you have is the same junior spies becoming mid-ranking spies, becoming top-ranking senior executive officers and analysts, and they're chasing the same bad actors. You know, it's always Masood Azza. It's always Elias Kashmiri until he dies. It's, it's always Amjad Faruqi until he was killed and so on and so forth. And so what you begin to see is how few people are needed to spill how so much blood. Very few people are needed. You know, there is, there, is, there, there is this small group of people who basically have created the architecture of terror, the architecture of insurgency, and a very small number of people have pursued them. And so actually what this is, is looking at those rival patterns between the two agency and telling some of these real stories, you know, like India doesn't like to commemorate its success or to point to its failure. And so what we were saying was, let's commemorate success and failure. Let's look, let, let's change the narrative. Let, let's see where, where things work when they didn't. And uh, that was an, our, our attempt to do so for ISI and for RA. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to start with, uh, the one thing that we should say is that um, India became very good at this. RAW and IB, the Intelligence Bureau, became very, very good at this and got right inside Jish e Muhammad after it was created um, in 2000, uh, with the first attacks in 2000, 2001, and got right inside gradually Lashkar Toiba as Lashkar picked up uh, the uptick of attacks, um, pat, um, you know, um, 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 in the late um, 1990s in particular. Um, and then a few um, in uh, post 9-11 period. Um, and they've manipulated those groups. And I, want, I wanted to tell a story in connection with that, which is in the book. It's really, really interesting. Like uh, proxies for Pakistan, you know, we all know about them. And uh, we, we, we talk about the, you know, the creatures of ISI. And um, um, uh, CIA, um, ISI uh, paramilitary officers and people who then went into the S-wing of ISI, dealing with special projects and uh, with jihad. Those people um, were trained, a lot of them, by CIA paramilitaries um, way back. And um, as soon as they got training, um, as an attempt to leverage um, Pakistan to work with CIA, we're talking about way back in the, in the Soviet periods, prior to the Afghan war, when Peshawar was um, a uh, air station for, um, for, for American um, intelligence services, um, and Gary Powers' plane took off from there. Um, the RSI took those skills and then attacked in India's fault lines. So it created proxy wars um, in the Northeast, in the Punjab, et cetera, et cetera, Kashmir, Andhra Pradesh, and many other places in, the, in that red corridor. But what's really interesting is that India saw this too, and rather than uh, trying to get training from CIA, because it couldn't, because it was more allied, as you pointed out, to FSB, KGB, to Russia, um, what, what it did was it got training from the UK. Um, and so a small group of officers end up in Northern Ireland, where um, um, Britain have been fighting the most bloody um, insurgency involving unbelievably duplicitous means, puppeteering um, death squads, um, assassinations, disappearings, torturing, um, um, extrajudicial killings, you name it, had happened in Northern Ireland from all sides, paramilitaries, government side, uh, security services, et cetera. And the in, a group of intel, in, Indian intelligence officers was trained here. And they took some of those observations and skills about puppeteering, what they call a double blind, where someone is uh, an asset who is deniable, is placed inside an organization where no one knows about them. And so you have people who no one understands what their function is or who they're working for, but they have a single handler and a single objective. So it's called a double blind. And those double blinds and those ploys would then come back 
and they would land in the Punjab um, in the 80s, 83, 84, 85, the splitting of that um, Khalistan movement, and they would then migrate into Kashmir, 89, well, post the 89 uprising in Kashmir, 1990, 1991, and they'd reached their peak with the creation of Indian proxies, uh, forced surrenders of the Ikhwanis, um, people who have become Ikhwan, uh, al Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood, and other groups, um, and those people would then fight for India as the pro-government renegades and, you know, sock puppets, if you like. And these sock puppets then existed in Andhra Pradesh and other places. So you had Pakistan and the, and the impetus for CIA. And, the, and then you have um, UK brutality in, in the six counties in Northern Ireland in the fight against IRA. And that's fueling counterinsurgency in India. So um, what the secret history shows you is some interesting elements of international propagation training, mentoring, but also what the external thinking is, you know, that leads to these uh, to these proxy wars. It's not just Pakistan. It's two sides fight, fighting, um, fighting these wars. Um, and I think there are other likenesses um, that, that, that come across um, as well. Um, you know, we, we very much associate um, through great, um, um, great um, psi war um, efforts by um, the RAW. Pakistan, you know, has long been labelled as a kind of terror state or the backer of terror, you know, and, and we know that certainly um, it's on the grey list still for the FATF. You think that yeah, yeah there's, 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 there's definitely a grudging respect, more than a grudging respect. Both sides, I think we discussed before, um, internally congratulate the other when they win. You know, good play, good job. You know, that's the, that's well done, you know, and there's lessons learned. How can we do better? How can we react faster? You know, and there's there's there's, there's more complexity. It's very much like the Soviet um, the Soviet period with CIA uh, and um, and then KGB. You know, hugely complex plays, lures sent out. Who who will grab on the lure? You know, uh, whether whether that's sexual or political or financial, the attempt to entrap people continually. Um, and, you know, we end up with situations like Kulbush and Yadav, which is a classic example, mm. which blows up in everyone's face. But I'm saying that from the Pakistan side, um, that their view um, was that he was an asset, not an officer. Okay. And they could see the conditions that lay there, perfect conditions to create a trap for India. And those conditions are that um, a man who has at least two forms of identity, both of which are official, both of which carry false information, both of which misdescribe his religion, but both of which link, one of which in particular, sorry, links back to um, his real parents' um, apartment yeah. block, one of whom is a senior police officer, it means that it's a perfect trap for them. There's a man with no cover, and he's got no cover because he's not an officer, and that's the difference between an officer and an asset. You know, um, an officer could be deeply embedded with multiple layers of cover and would be harder to find. An asset is somebody who simply um, responds to um, supervision and handling and provides information in a low-key sense. Well, um, only both sides will be able to tell, you know, in time will, will we be able to tell. The opinions right now seem to be that Pakistan spotted an opportunity um, and that India had a facility. And that facility was post-2611. Post-2611, first of all, there was a need. And that need was step up to develop and deploy assets deep inside Pakistan and in neighbouring states that will help to blow the whistle on future operations involving Jaish, Lashkar Toiba, um, Al Qaeda, and um, other ISI, um, other ISI related groups. Um, given that nearly all action had been defeated in Kashmir um, and been shut down by Musharraf, given that Musharraf's peace channel was open and working, and almost came to the point of success, um, you know these groups were forming elsewhere. They were operating in Karachi and um, in the marshes um, on the coastal belt. Um, uh, around, around Karachi. So there's a need there post 2611. All agencies um, want to explore that need, the Indian Navy, IB and RAW. And there's a fight that's been brewing since 2001 between IB and RAW because IB is frustrated by the monopolization of raw resources by RAW. Technical intelligence is monopolized when it comes from abroad. 
But also, um, IB resented the fact that um, although India was the theatre for when stuff exploded and blood was let, um, the plans were fermented abroad. So an IB officer who's on a beat was saying, why do I have to stop at the border? Why can't, why can't I continue over the border? Because Lashka's plotting over the border. You know, the plots are not, the genesis is not here. And so there's this competition going on. So a man like Yadav um, is, a, is a prospect at that point. And the interviews that we've got, um, we've had with people suggest very strongly that, uh, you know, if you have someone who has the ability to travel from Iran into Pakistan, down to Karachi, which is the city of interest in particular, where Roar is already deployed. And, uh, you know, that, that becomes something that would be irresistible for individual officers who may supervise, you know, what did you see? What did you hear? Where were you? Um, this kind of informal, uh, informal approach. ISI spot that and think we could grow this, which is where they come up with this idea to uh, get him to accept plans for a Pakistan Air Force base. Um, and they do it for two reasons. One is because, as we discussed before, what cops do is cops detect crimes and then put them through the criminal justice system and the case is closed. What spies do is spies latch onto crimes and let them run as long as possible so you can see the network that the, the, the criminal relates to. So if you set this man up and you germinate an idea and you thrust upon him plans for a Pakistan aim, um, army base, uh, first, of, first of all, he's now committing a treat, you know, a, ser a serious criminal offence. Second of all, who might he relate to? Would he try and find Baluch nationalists who are gunmen? Would he try and seek out insurgent groups, uh, um, Jundala slash Jaisal Adil, the same group with two different names, et cetera, et cetera. So they grew him from a minnow into a whale. And, you know, at the, at the background of all of this, what we have is a family man with kids who lives in Mumbai, who now is jammed, jammed between the spy wars between two sides. And, you know, um, I mean, the first thing to say is that really good intelligence operations mean that you don't leave phone numbers hanging around in clues and, you know, there's no paperwork as such. They, they're deniable operations done through cutouts, so you have to be very careful. So it'd be a stupid person or someone who's lying who said that there, there's this mountain of evidence which shows, you know, in paper trails X, Y and Z. There are not. There are plenty of opinions on both sides. And the opinions on both sides um, and the circumstantial evidence that surrounds them suggests that um, certainly uh, that there, there is um, a tracking and a belief on the Pakistan side that um, India made connections um, through its assets with TTP absolutely in Balochistan all the time. Um, and of course, India is massively um, active in Chabahar in the Iranian port. And of course, Chabahar is the natural competitor only 70 kilometers apart from Gwadar. And Gwadar is controlled by China. And so you can see here, we've got China, Pakistan uh, in Gwadar. We've got RAW Iran in Chabahar. So we've got two ports tracking into Central Asia. Um, and there's a strategic tilt here. And so again, that comes back to Yadav. Yadav's working in Chabahar. So, um, you know, there, there, there are important things there. Also, um, the other operations that, you know, become obvious, um, uh, which are hot operations, which are a full spectrum um, uh, security service like uh, RAW and I, you know, IB also would take part in, um, include using the forces um, that are opposed to the Pakistani state. Your enemy's enemy is your friend. This, this is not, you know, th this is classic intelligence work. It's what, what RAW should be doing. And um, it was doing that with MQM when MQM was divided and you had, you know, the different factions um, as a result of Altaf Hussein's, you, you know, being um, uh, dispatched to his exile in Edgware in North London. And then you have the other groups of, um, uh, of MQM. RAW sidles up to them and it doesn't do it in Pakistan. Where would they do that? They do it in London. They do it in Vienna. They do it in Geneva. You know, a lot of this work doesn't take place inside the theatre. It takes place in safe European havens. So we can say, this, you know, with, with, with some certainty that these operations go on. And India's great, great success is to project itself as benign. You know, I mean, it's a masterful thing. It's done through soft power and hard power. And this balloon, this cloak of benign, you know, a, a benign cloak falls around it. And so it presents itself as a perpetual as patient victim, yeah. victim of, of Pakistan terror. Yeah. And, you know, good play, as, as yeah. ISI would say, good play. I don't think we can say. I think what we can say is that um, America um, has had a calamitous and disastrous 
uh, relationship with Afghanistan. And if you look at the reports that have just been revealed that were made in confidence to the Inspector General uh, in the America who was um, looking at lessons learned within the Pentagon, what you see is a frankness from military officers, political advisors, intelligence officers, and that frankness shows that at a time when America could have concentrated on, and the Taliban were weak, on building institutions, they went and fought a war in Iraq. And so because they then didn't care about Afghanistan, they, they were then uh, running third grade policies in Afghanistan while they, while, while they got sucked into a civil war and a bloodbath between uh, Shias and Sunnis and America and, and, and Shias and America and Sunnis and the Sunni Triangle, the Mahdi Army, et cetera, in, in, in Iraq. This is Donald Rumsfeld's territory. Um, you know, a guy who decided not to put the right number of boots on the ground, who, who had the miser's attitude to fighting a war. And what we're left with is failed institutions, police service that's despised, an army um, that has all the best equipment but is inept, um, and a centralised form of army, police and government that won't be accepted in ethnocentric Afghanistan. So, you know, if we accept that, and it's really important in all of this to say that this is America's doing, right? Then we, if we accept that, what, 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 what can India do? India has done many of the things that one would expect, no? It has attempted to put in cash. It's attempted to create a relationship. And perhaps, you know, its biggest failing is it only very late in the day did it bank on the other side. You know, it spent so long bidding for the present um, dispensation in Kabul that they're very late to now be going to Doha. They're very late to be saying, you know, you know let, let, let's be real that, you know, Kabul does not equal Afghanistan. So let's see what they can do. Um, Doha talks are dead. It does not matter what is discussed in Doha. You know, we know from today that um, America's um, so desperate, it's now doing deals uh, through Khalil Zad, the intermediary, to preserve um, the US embassy in Kabul and stop it being sacked. You know, we're in the, we're in the fall of Saigon right now. Don't, don't you know, have no doubt. A lot of people will die. It's um, it's a terrible state. So it's wrong to lambast India. We can say that we can say that security services are too slow. They put too many eggs into one basket for sure. It's not Pakistan. It's not Pakistan that is the worry at all. You know, in 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 this sense, yet again, and you know, this is stuff that we talked about before, vis-a-vis -vis political projections of yeah. the meaning of Pathankot and Bawalpur, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, Balakot um, and Paul Wama. You know, the political projection is to show the Pakistan institutions are to blame. They're not to blame. The evidence does not say that. The evidence suggests that um, groups have decamped as a result of constant purging by Pakistan to Afghanistan. Those groups are operating in lawless spaces given up by the British, Lashkar near to Khost also. And they, they've melted with elements of Al-Qaeda, recidivist elements of Al-Qaeda. They're there with elements of Islamic State, a few people from TTP, Pakistan Taliban. And they're forming these, these, these deadly amalgams, which are battle hardened. And they, they, you know, we cannot rely on the fact that they won't attack everybody. And there are spoilers in, in this play as well. Iran is a spoiler with a lot of um, you know, reasons to strike back. Russia is a spoiler that lost before in Afghanistan with a lot of reasons to hit back against Biden's America. Now Trump's gone. And so the spoilers are there. You know, Turkey said um, it would come in and, and uh, you know, guard the airstrip, et cetera, to, you know, in an attempt to be a regional superpower. That, that won't happen. You know, what, what we're left with is the spoilers. We're left with the, um, the dead space, you know, the failed state dead space where evil, you know, evil will, will thrive and dangerous, dangerous groups will clump together like they did before the big mass operations in Fatah, in Waziristan, north and south. You know, they formed permanent colonies there. They intermarried. Um, they were deep down inside the community. And my God, it took a lot of blood to root them out. And the fearful thing now is that that will happen in Afghanistan along the Doran line. There are changes. Reasons to be happy are they spent a lot of money fortifying the Doran line. Um, you know, they've got a, quite a good fence, which is almost finished. They've got very good sensor devices there. And the army is now practiced in counterinsurgency. So they're, they're reasons to be optimistic. Um, and as you point out, Taliban is not India's enemy. I mean, the early reporting, the really fascinating thing is that you see the reporting from 2002 and then in particular 2003 inside Pakistan. And it 
goes on and on about the need to annihilate uh, Jaysh Mahmud and the need to kill, not arrest, Lashkar Jangvi. They, they, they would butcher them if they could get hold of them because of the damage that they were going to cause. And if, of course, they all ran up um, into Balochistan and then in, 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 into Waziristan and no one could get the right kind of gravity um, until 2014-15 to begin those operations for very, very specific political reasons. You know, and then what happens is these events happen which are despicable and diabolical, but particularly we're talking about Paul Wama. I mean, those pictures are, are awful. Anyone looking at those pictures, you're inhuman if your heart does not miss a beat looking at those photographs of, 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 uh, of the carnage that was created there. Yet what the, what the intelligence shows on both sides, because you know they both do lessons learned, they both do what yeah. they call a triage, and they both do um, an assessment. And the lessons on both sides were completely different from the political messaging. They were that the command and control structure was in southern Afghanistan, that um, um, entry um, had been... Um, through um, Jammu, that's true, but um, um, the telephone, uh, the telephone intercepts and all the other businesses had taken place in Afghanistan, and a lot of weapons supply was in there as well as staging grounds, etc. And um, I think we discussed before that um, another um, really vital thing is the um, design of the bomb. It's really important. There's a whole group of people who just study. Uh, they're they're like. Um, they're, they're forensic psychologists in a sense, or forensic chemists and, and architects. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're interested in the etiology of the forensic scene. And what you learn is it's a very similar device. It is related to the Marriott bombing. And it's related in very specific ways, the use of aluminium powder, um, which is an attempt to create a kind of thermo, they call it a thermobaric device, whereby you create um, an enormous heat through the part the powder and then it, 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 it sucks it sucks out all the oxygen and it increases the for, force of the explosion and it destroyed as we know the marriott hotel and um we'll come there's actually a very interesting spy story inside the marriott hotel which we'll get to in a second but but the reason i raise this is it's the same bombing structure and so that means what you've got is you've got the al-qaeda jaysh element who are together in the marriott attack um, um a legacy group from anja faruqi Ilyash kashmiris 313 and the same group are together in Lashkagar and in Host and they're, they're, they're together attacking in Pulwama. Now that would be, um, you know, the forensic report, but what happened instead? What happened instead was <laughs> bang the gong. Yeah. Pakistan did this, right. Pakistan want war. What, you know, I think, I think we can, it's fair to say that, that you know, nothing, that, that was absolutely not the case, right? Take us to the near war, the election's coming. And, and then don't rely on um, the sourcing in the book for this. We rely on the annexure in the law case. And the annexure shows the WhatsApp messages and other social media messages um, that existed between Republic TV, et cetera, which tell us that three days beforehand there was knowledge of this. You know, Balakot had emptied. Um, the interesting thing is that the Pulwama file notes that the command and control wasn't Balakot. You know, Balakot, it's, it's a symbolic strike. It's a symbolic strike. It's, it's there, again, to appeal and address the voice in India. Control thoughts and emotions. You know, this is the war. Any country would do it. Yeah, you know, okay. these, these, these are wonderful stories. These are wonderful stories. And yet the funny thing about these great propaganda victories is that this is not to say that um, RAW, Raw, Raw IB are not doing plenty of kinetic work um, elsewhere that is real. They are all the time. They, they, they're, they're at this moment, uh, you know, attempting to recruit somebody in, in something that we call wind of, um, who is one of the most deadly arms and drug traffickers in Africa. And they're actively engaged in discussions with him. You know, they are doing this stuff because that's what full spectrum intelligence organizations do. But they're also playing the political game. Yeah. And so this is an attempt to see the scaffolding that lies behind democracy. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think I think um, the the um, um, FSB relationship is well overstressed. You know, um, there are things which um, India does not like that it looks into that it, when it sees Russia. And things it does not identify with when it sees Putin, and um, you know there's a need. A can India has understood that there's a need that they can exploit. America's need is to create 
um, a uh, new order of play in the Pacific. And India recognizes that it can exploit that need in order to cash in on greater intelligence sharing um, and where necessary, some mentoring in technical intelligence. And, you know, um, this is um, this also is what lies behind uh, the relationship with Israel, you know, and they move far more down that path towards um, Israel um, and uh, particularly involved in the intelligence grid in Kashmir and the LOC line of control, the way the way that's been uh, um, way that's run. And, um, you know, they, um, that that goes down to their command and control for um, um, for, for a a a aerial combat, not just intelligence. So Israel and America are vitally important. As soon as, as, soon as Pakistan and CIA got back together post-2001, you know, Raw's first mission is to smash it, smash that pack. Oh my God, the people were apoplectic. I cannot believe that the CIA have done this. Really white hot anger from India, that, that this age old abusive relationship is back, back on, you know, the abusive relationships come round again. And, um, and, 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 you know, as we said last time, they try and smash it from the, from the out. The Colin Powell conspiracy, um, which then figures, you know, the Stingers, Elias Kashmiri, all the other things. Um, when that doesn't work, um, the 9-11 being funded by, um, you know, uh, an Islamic Republic, they try that. They do really well on that. It gets lots of traction. Wall Street Journal reports it. You know, smash it, smash the pack, do what we can. And then by about 2004, um, a very important legal counsel in Condoleezza Rice's office, Secretary of State, says, look, you know, having read a lot of papers that have come out of Brookings, we should reposition India. We should slowly reposition our relationship with India, not just bank on Pakistan. And so then you see the beginnings of a, a military, security, nuclear series of deals that are coming together. Um, and it begins with a civil um, India, a civil nuclear pact, and it grows from that into intelligence sharing. By 2009, um, um, uh, you've got a high level after 2611. You've got a high level coming together of the American NSA, um, National Security Agency. You've got GCHQ in Cheltenham. Cheltenham GCHQ is technical intelligence in the UK, as you know. And, and they are inviting... Um, RAW and other agencies in India to step up to these meetings, which are known as double SPAC, SPAC. And in these SPAC meetings, you know, they're, they're, they're trialed. There are some disasters along the way, learning. And then they're, 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 they share huge amounts of technical intelligence. And from that we go, you can draw a line right the way through. They get hold of their own um, packages from Germany and the UK called Finfisher. And that allows them to attack Blackberries and conventional Androids, not so good with um, Apple. Um, unless they're jailbroken. And from Finn Fisher, they go into centralized monitoring. From centralized monitoring, Thanks. they begin to make the deal with the NSO in 2017 slash 18. And then Pegasus is put on a trial run. The deal is signed 2019, it begins running. And you know they begin exploring Pegasus between 2019 and 21. What, what can one say? What one can say is that um, as um, Snowden pointed out, after 9-11 and the Patriot Act was passed and unlimited budgets were released, intelligence agencies developed facilities and skills and techniques which far outstripped the law. They outpieced the legislation. And so that means that, you know, governments and legislatures aren't ready, that they're not knowledgeable, so they don't know. And so we're in that position now. We're in the position where um, all, all of, you know, we can't count on the fact that, um, you know, our, our, our parliaments, as Snowden kept saying, um, you know, they haven't legislated fast enough or they don't even understand the Vegas concept. So, you know, just two examples, which relates to your question on Pegasus. You know, um, after 7-7 um, in London and the bombs on, on the public transport network, you know, a analysis of intelligence showed that they knew all the individuals, but they didn't know how the individuals related to each other. And that's because they were talking on burner phones and they're phones that you pick up and dispose and throw away as drug dealers and criminals the world over. And some journalists use burner phones the world over. Mm. But yeah. at the same time, they then worked out an algorithm um, and also um, a series <laughs> of patterning, which enabled them to find burner phones. And so here you have an example where uh, a crime is committed and a skill is put to that crime um, and then suddenly, you know, now that that 
facility, then got them into contact chaining, which shows how you get people to relate to each other through metadata, burner phones, satellite phones, contact chaining, and um, you know, there's a straight line from there into all kinds of mass collection, mass data collection, which affects all of us. Our data is being harvested, it's being scraped, yeah. it's being sold, and it's being bartered. And incidentally, in the midst of all this, in, two, in, in 2007, um, they come across the 2611 plans. And that's how they discover when they're working on the algorithm and working on the coding for burner phones, for satellite phones, contact chaining, and the liminal space, this empty space. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, the, the answer is we don't know. We know we know that they, they, they had more than 18 warnings. We wrote that in the, yeah. the book, The Siege. We documented those warnings. We read them. The warnings are very precise. They name how many people will come that by sea. They don't name the landing spots, but they name all of the targets. And after 2611, publicly, we only have Pradhan. We've got 68 pages of nonsense. Uh, privately, you know, a lot of introspection, a lot of soul searching. You know, I mean, yeah, we, we, we've got like maybe a, a sense in, in what happened later in Kashmir of, of how they began to unify intelligence together. And now when you see, for example, the way that Wuhan Wani was hunted, you have everyone playing a role, BSF, DIA, and military intelligence, RAW, IB, um, technical, uh, uh, technical intelligence. And all of these people, NTRO, all of these people are now bearing down on target. So I think there is that sort of uh, more unified, um, unified intelligence. But that's a question you should put to them, you know, mm. uh, because they, they do not publicly like to, as we said at the beginning, uh, memorialize failure or even celebrate success. And this, there's this, you know, I could never believe the fact that 2611 happened and there's this tiny memorial inside the Taj Hotel lobby, you know, but you have to look really hard to find. Yeah. And there's the Pradhan report, you know, and we were saying to each other before, 100,000 pages in the National Archives in Kew or more, you know, 9-11, you should see the 9-11 um, uh, evidence and the evidence after um, renditions, black sites and enhanced interrogation, the Senate intelligence inquiry into torture. You know, it runs, runs into thousands of pages of anecdotes. There's this need, you know, to debate and to see. And uh, I think that happens internally and it may not be, you know, um, we, we, we're, not, we're not privy to it. I think I think that um, he's action definitely uh, action orientated. He's a narrative builder. He's a storyteller, you know, and he's also someone who um, um, you know who likes to um, control the narrative. And so you know we're seeing that the narrative control is a big part of this. Look what's going on in Kashmir all the time. You know, you silence everybody. You silence politicians. You silence uh, social media. You control and penetrate social media. You, you know, you uh, you um, you cower that make the courts cower. So th th there's no no functioning elements of the state. And also, you know, law, law is denied. Remember, we're still operating at the time of PSA. Uh, we're still operating um, at the time of Armed Forces Special Powers Act, ASPA. And so the result is that, you know, the state of law is permanently upended. You know, and in that in that blank space, you create narrative control. You intimidate journalists. You tell them what they can and cannot say. And, um, you know, these these we, we then learn are potentially temporary measures because there was then the possibility yet again of another back channel. And, um, you know, my understanding is that that back channel would have been possible um, because at that time, um, uh, Mr. Dabala removed everything from the table, you know, and that's why the back channel could work because Kashmir was not on the table. Yeah. You know, the, the, the back channel really there was about was about uh, finding peace on, 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 on another level. And so, um, you know, I think um, can, I can point to some positives. I think it's important to balance stuff. I, I think that they've created an agile apparatus. Um, and, you know, that's an important thing. It responds very quickly. Um, I think they've reached out to countries that um, have not loved India. Um, and they're wooing them in a very clever way. Saudi Arabia, Gulf states. Um, they now have extradition agreements, which have created huge problems for um, outfits like D Company, you know, okay. these extradition agreements would never have happened before. And, and you know, that kind of intelligent, you know, there's, there, there's a kind of questioning, an intelligent questioning that takes place. So, um, you know, these things really matter. Um, these, things, these, thing, these things really, really matter. And, you know, there's, 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 there's other positives, their outreach to foreigners, their outreach to um, 
control opinion abroad. Um, it's sophisticated. Um, and there is a lot of um, stage fog, as we call it, you know, the fogging of real events. Theatrical fog is everywhere at the moment. Um, and um, maybe one could say that the other side of it is within the organisations, IB and RAW, there is both a radicalisation, as happened in Pakistan, interestingly, more religious, more chauvinist, more nationalist, and there are those who resist it. Because the security organisations are a mirror of the societies they exist in. And there are the secular intellectuals. And there are the chauvinist intellectuals and the chauvinist analysts and the secular analysts. And, and, and so you see pushback all the time. You see uh, definitely uh, a nationalist agenda, an assertive Hindu uh, nationalist chauvinist agenda emerging. And you see others who talk about it and express their fears of it. So, you know, it is it is a reflection of the divisions that divisions that exist in all of our societies right now. We're all debating this. America's debating this, uh, you know. Um, it's really important all the time to say that these are not accept no exceptionalism with India. The, these are national global trends, truthfulness, truth versus lies, the power of lies, the power of social media, right wing media, popularism, authoritarianism. These are global issues right now. So it's not it's not an, it doesn't reflect on 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 the fragility of Indian democracy. It reflects on where the world is right now. Uh, Britain is suffering from it, reeling from it, reeling from it. Our disastrous COVID strategy. Never mind um, India's disastrous COVID strategy. Ours was disastrous. Italy's was disastrous. The, the organisations were hollowed out um, after partition. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're quite communal. They don't recruit widely. Um, and various raw, senior raw executives have repeatedly pushed to destroy the IPS structure of, re of, of recruitment and promotion. They've repeatedly pushed to um, uh, recruit widely across the communities, castes, religion, faith, colour. You know, they want groups that are, speak all the languages, that have, you know, the super clever diaspora, you know, that, that's involved in, involved in artificial intelligence that can speak Chinese. This is the way of the Indian diaspora, like the Jewish diaspora. You know, it's this phenomenally entrepreneurial, people but they're not in intelligence <laughs> you know they're not and 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 that that is the struggle that nsa cia had mi5 mi6 had um and um raw a uh, raw and ib have not been allowed to address it and because they don't have a constitutional position they don't have a charter and that's because they're often used as a political football by different governments not just the bjp many different governments nda narasimha rao was a great one for using them as a political football so, you know, and they've been bled dry in other cases, not loved, uh, lost all their funding. Ordinary people do not engage with highly dangerous issues like this. You know, I, my, my family grew up, uh, but they're, they're from um, the Czech, Czech Republic and from Hungary. Okay. And uh, in, in, when we go and visit them in, in Budapest, uh, half the family were in the Communist Party and they were also involved in um, the um, intelligence service and the secret police. And the other half were against the Communist Party and were sort of freedom activists. And so the agreement was that over dinner, when we sat together, no one would talk about politics. <laughs> And so consequently, these big meals would happen, 20 people sit around the table and it's just, you know, just chit, 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 chit. And then the meal finishes and the communists went off into their social club and the anti-communists went off into their social clubs. And Pakistan is in that position. People accept that families are divided. They accept there's foji, there's non-foji, there's uh, uh, ISI, non-ISI, ISI, but um, there is no room for public debate on that right now. And you've seen that, that authoritarianism means people are, are afraid to express their views. And, you know, increasingly, it has to be said, it's not easy to express your views in India either. Yeah, you know, I think, I think when we look back at all of this and we begin to piece together the ladder, you know, a lot of it was declared actually very openly from public sources. You know, a lot of it was in repeatedly in all of the different political manifestos, you know, and we, we can see how we reach this point and, you know, the different pieces of luck and skill that have led to the rise of a different kind of authoritarianism. And um, yeah, I mean, it's caused great divisions 
you know, looking from the outside, some of it is really quite staggering. But then, you know, the history is vast. And that means that this will be a small blip. And, you know, what will happen afterwards will be a new period of renewal. But right now it feels very painful and very claustrophobic. Not oh, in India, definitely. Video. With the, uh, with as we talked about before, with the regional divide, with the language divide, with the cultural community divide, you know, south, north, east, west, it's impossible. You know, there there are just too many. Um, there are too, there are too many people who will not allow that to happen. Who are who are regional power players, and you know, we we've seen that already in in uh, um, you know in terms of the uh, the interesting. Um, uh, uh, more recent election results, etc. But but much more precisely than that, just in the intimate, um, wildly different, divergent cultures, you know, from the northeast down um, to the southernmost tip, um, there there are no, you know, there are very few political and social uh, commonalities, and that means that they can't be that. There can be a massaging of populist views, which can cause immense damage. The stage fog can cause immense damage. The endless demonising of um, the Islamophobia, the hatred. The communalism. We're seeing that now. Look at the video released hmm. yesterday or today, this morning. You know, the ch looking at the children. You know, I mean, this this is this this is affecting all countries. We're all experiencing this communalism. Britain is experiencing it horrendously, horrendously. Anti-Asian violence in America. It's not India's problem. It's a global issue, but India is not so easy to control. from anybody you know you can't write a book and and and, deli and deliver it to be for approval that's not that's not a book that's a polemic yeah and so you know and also why be a part of a system if you knew it was rigged in the end we are very careful and that there is nothing in there that um that can undermine a named officer their general views with named officers talking about how they see things um and you know those views are based on their enormous experience and decades of service when it comes to sensitive information, uh, news stories, um, those are not attributed to anybody, you know, and those are those that's information that's, you know, gl that's gleaned. So I think if you don't name people, you know, um, you're in you're in the sources culture, you know, and all of these books which attempt just to say, you know, well, someone said, you know, th then you could be part of the stage fog. But here you're saying, actually, these are the views that they have. And, you know, I think I said to you before, we, you know, 90 percent of the book has not been published because it's too sensitive or it would be inappropriate or, or it would cause hatred or, you know. And so you have to be you have to be responsible and, and look at the material and say, what can I do with it? We, later we'll use it. I mean, we got given some stuff by um, certain people that they said, wait till we're dead. You know, and, and if you're alive and we're dead, please use it. And uh, if while we're alive, please don't. And we haven't broken those rules. And, you know, we've not published, we've not published transcripts, but we've got transcripts, you know, of all of, all of our talks, of course. But, you know, have to be sensitive to people. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> don't worry. Take Bye. care. Have a good Thanks evening. A lot.